Ambassador Lakshmi Puri, whom many of you in this room know and whose work many of us admire, have admired for many years. Um, she, she is the former Assistant Secretary General of the UN and Deputy Executive Director of UN Women. And prior to that, she served as an Indian diplomat for 28 years. Uh, she ha was India's ambassador to Hungary, while also concurrently to Bosnia-Herzegovina in a very difficult time. And during her term, she worked closely with the UN peacekeeping operation in Bosnia-Herzegovina. She was also in charge of the Japan and Korea desk as, and as uh, of the MEA. And she was in the multilateral economic relations division for many years. Ambassador Puri was active in negotiating India's many bilateral and multilateral economic diplomacy initiatives, such as the Look East policy, Indo-ASEAN dialogue partnership, the Indian Ocean Rim, BIMSTEC, and the Group of 15 Forum. And in 2020, 2002, she was appointed director at UNCTAD and the flagship division on trade in goods and services. She was, of course, as, as you know, director of the United Nations Office of the High Representative for the least developed countries and landlocked developed countries and small island states that are now raising their voice against climate change and, uh, and pleading for sane interventions. And she was, of course, deputy uh, executive director of UN Women at a very critical time when they were transiting from UNIFEM to UN Women and giving themselves a much broader mandate. And she has fashioned in many ways that lexicon that talks about the link between the local, the national, and the international. She's got several awards, as is as to be expected. I'm just going to read out a couple. The Eleanor Roosevelt Award for Human Rights, the Novus Award for Championing Sustainable Development Goals, and the Millennium Campus Award, among others. Ambassador Puri will, given her extensive experience as an animator for gender equality at the global level, will speak on how she fostered linkages between the grassroots initiatives and UN agencies and also the evolution of India's own uh, sort of approach to, uh, to women in, uh, in peace building. I'm not saying the WPS agenda because that carries a different connotation, <laughs> but yeah. over to you, uh, Ambassador Puri. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Gopinath. And uh, after that absolutely masterful uh, opening, uh, it, you know, many of us would find it, find ourselves inadequate to rise to all the uh, epic questions that you have raised in your um, um, speech. So, uh, but anyway, let me uh, first of all begin by thanking you and the WISCOMP as well as the EU missions and uh, um, ambassador of Netherlands, ambassador of it Italy, and others here for championing this very cardinal issue of women, peace, and security in the larger context of what is very clearly a global public good a project of humanity that the United Nations has been trying to promote. As you said, it's under strain, has always been under strain, but more now than ever before. So in that context, I think it's very important, and I think you've told me to focus on um, my experiences uh, in uh, advancing this women, peace, and security agenda uh, at the global level, but of course, from the global to the national and national to the local, because you cannot do anything when you don't have the links all properly sealed. So before I speak on what UN Women achieved, did uh, at all levels, let me record that we institutionally would have not been able to do anything without the political support 
financial investment, uh, mobilization, and advocacy and convening <coughs> by the European Union. And their championing of this uh, idea, and idea is the power. Uh, and uh, its member states in every respect. And my, I recall my own EU engagements on women, peace, and security over the seven years, the seven founding years of UN Women, where particularly where we worked on Syria where we worked on Colombia, which Colombia, by the way, is one of the more successful examples of women, peace and security, and Sahel. That's the other area where I worked very closely with the European Union and the UN women. Um, now, Atharva Veda um, said in its wisdom that war begins in the minds of men, and that has been incorporated in the UNESCO Constitution. And also the UNESCO Constitution says that the defenses of peace must be constructed in the minds of men. The spirit and substance of women, peace and security is about affirming that it is more in the minds of women that peace has to be constructed. But more importantly, peace has to be waged. So that is the important uh, you know, connotation of women, peace, and security. So that is the concept of women, peace, and security. And that was a groundbreaking achievement in 2000. So when we came in, you very rightly pointed out the four Ps of uh, women, peace, and security agenda. But very quickly, I want to annotate that a little bit. First of all, it is about women's voice, participation, and leadership. We in India in the context of G20, we have pioneered that concept and we have consecrated it into the G20 New Delhi De Leaders Declaration, the concept of women-led development, but it is also about the concept of women-led peace. So women's voice participation leadership, that's one. So participation. The second is uh, their special role in prevention of conflict. And uh, so the P of prevention. And the third is the protection of women and girls because they are differentially impacted, they are differentially targeted and victimized. And so there is a different call for protection and uh, also uh, ensuring that the post-conflict, this is the, the fourth thing, relief and recovery, reconstruction efforts, must meet the needs of women and girls and engage their agency and build back better uh, in terms of gender equal governance, uh, economy, and society. So that is the holistic concept of women, peace, and security. So as you said, when you're talking about peace, you, you know, you, you talked about how we must uh, organize for uh, peace as well as we must organize for war. It is in the same spirit that we must understand how this can be then applied to armed conflict. And uh, the, how it is undervalued, underutilized resource. And uh, also, women's equal and full participation as active agents at all levels of peace and security policy and action, local, provincial, national, regional, and global. And also, you rightly emphasize the continuum of peace 
to development, to sustainable development. So that another that adds another layer of the women, peace, and security policy, and I would call it ideology. Now, UN Women's Signal role was that women, peace, and security was identified as one of the four key focus areas of UN Women. And we worked in uh, terms of strengthening that agenda in every way but also pushing for its implementation in seminal ways. How did we do that? So we built and strengthened the norms and international norms and standards through intergovernmental bodies, especially the UN Security Council. And I was uh, very much directly working on that portfolio and its subsidiary bodies, of course, working groups and other, other bodies. Then we pushed the system, the UN system, which was directly involved in peace keeping, peace building, the entire peace architecture of the UN, to get them to coordinate, first of all, gender mainstream, and then coordinate among themselves on this agenda. And then we activated advocacy and movement building among member states, because we needed to do movement building also among member states. We're here. Uh, yes, absolutely. And we were uh, great, uh, shall I say, co-conspirators. <laughs> uh, also, to get the developing countries engaged because there seemed to be some hesitation in, in joining that. And also uh, to, um, you know, there is a huge peace constituency, whether it is on the disarmament side, there are, there are other peace NGOs and civil society movements to engender them to gender mainstream this civil society, which is the peace constituency. That, is, that was very important. And then to foster and grow the women peace and security civil society itself, the women's groups. Because if, as you said, there is the IR uh, component, and then there is the, uh, the, the grassroots women, but also at different levels at the national, provincial, and, and grassroots local levels. So getting them together to mobilize them, that was one of our major uh, thrusts. What we call the, we the people have to be made part of this. And then uh, we developed a credible data and knowledge base on the why, what, and how of women, peace, and security. Because it's always met with skepticism or derision, or neglect. So we have to make a convincing case why it matters, why women matter in peace, and why their leadership matters, and why their interest matters for sustainable peace. And that has been proven, but we have to continue to make the case. Then we try to secure through UN Women programs on the ground, and that's the connect to the local on the ground of how leveraging WPS agenda for sustainable peace really makes a difference. And uh, WPS becomes a reality in the actual you know, ground situation um, on, on um, both our programs, but also uh, programs that are, for example, peacekeeping. Uh, act, uh, area uh, conflict countries where peacekeeping is be, UN peacekeeping is being done, or the PBC countries, the peace building commission countries. So we were working on the ground with them. Uh, we also picked up the 1325 Baton and ran a relentless marathon, I would say, uh, to give life, content, and direction and meaning to this policy innovation and to implement it more vigorously and systematically. And I want to emphasize that, systematically. Not just uh, 
you know, on, on whim of someone, uh, one policy maker, but as a systematic practice, as a systematic thinking uh, of, um, of um, and, and, and uh, strategizing around that as the EU have done. They have a strategy, they have a systematic way of acting in, in these kind of situations. Now, the UN Security Council, you mentioned the resolutions, the 10 UN Security Council resolutions, and we were instrumental in pushing through um, and bridging the differences within the UN Security Council there were many differences, the West versus sometimes Russia and China, and there were other kind of uh, polarities that needed to be bridged. And I think we were very successful and credited, UN Women was credited with bringing that, uh, being that bridge. So the 10 UN resolutions, I will not go through all the numbers, I think they are available, but also, uh, we ensured that uh, UN women ensured that an open debate on women, peace, and security in October, November every year would be held, and a resolution or a presidential uh, statement would be adopted to further uh, recommend, clarify, expand, deepen mandates, and set out conditions for effective implementation. And then we updated, continue to normatively update and insert new issues, uh, including uh, on countering violent extremism, how women, peace, and security is related to countering violent extremism, or how it is linked to humanitarian situations, women, peace, and security. So these are the kind of uh, ideational progression that happened. Then we secured the informal expert group of the Security Council, serviced by UN women within UN Security Council to constantly drive, review, and monitor women, uh, women peace and security mainstreaming and implementation in all key peace undertakings of the UN. And uh, regularly presented reports to the UN Security Council. And though through this advocacy, certain practices, like a report, every time a report was presented, say, on Myanmar or on any other conflict situation that the UN Security Council had mandated, they would compulsorily present a section on how they were incorporating women, peace, and security agenda. So these kind of practices, that systematic, <laughs> systematic in inclusion happened. Then the engendering the 2015 um, so very quickly then I will um, go on to um, how the peace review that was carried out in 2015, how we engendered it, the entire peace architecture was then engendered, we made sure that women, peace, and security was uh, incorporated in uh, all the peacekeeping missions and all the other areas. Similarly, convincing peace actors on the ground. Peace actors are typically patriarchal. We were just discussing with Patricia how it is difficult to convince peace actors on the ground. Uh, and also governments of troop contributing countries and host countries. So that has been a challenge. Turf issues, uh, then the question of uh, uphill task for women to advocate on the soft issues of gender equality. You mentioned that, soft and hard. Uh, when member states and their instruments on the ground were preoccupied with the hard, everyday challenges of peace. And then, of course, um, uh, you know, the positive side is we did manage to convince many member states that women's agency, when deployed, is indispensable for peace. We supported women peace actors and one part and, and our participation in the UN Secretary General's Executive Committee, the highest executive body, uh, 
ended up giving us the leverage to influence his commitment to the UN's peace and security project. And then we, of course, did a 15-year-old review, 15-year review of 1325 in 2015. That was historic because we, we gathered evidence, we presented evidence about the validity of the women, peace, and security, and how it had been a success. The success stories. Unless you bring success stories, it doesn't convince people. So uh, then we had also, of course, um, um, India's role. I think uh, others will speak to it. But I will just very quickly mention that um, uh, we work very closely with uh, women, peace, and security champion countries, UN Security Council, especially the Western group and advocated with others. And India, of course, has been an advocate of women, peace, and security. And it has, uh, in, uh, in action, demonstrated that by con being a pioneer in contributing uh, to the peacekeeping missions, all women peacekeeping missions, the Liberia. Now it has uh, also a female engagement team from India deployed in DRC and rapidly, rapidly deployable battalion in MONUSCO. And it has pledged a FPU under the peacekeeping readiness capability system. So uh, this commitment is there. They are playing an important part, Indian women peacekeepers, and uh, mentoring role for women, military observers, and government forces to prevent conflict-related sexual violence, because that's a very important part of women's uh, the WPS as well. And uh, the UN Women, through its India country office, continues to provide gender training to thousands of peacekeepers from across the globe to educate them on their responsibilities under Security Council uh, 1325. And I know uh, that there are, uh, Malika is here from, um, uh, no, sorry, Roshan is here from uh, USI and other institutions who are co collaborating on this training. And then, of course, there is the national action plans. There are now 100 nat oh, 106 national action plans, I think, by now. And many of the, and 13 feminist foreign countries with feminist foreign policy, since you mentioned that. And uh, I've just written, I, I will just quickly mention that I've written extensively on the feminist foreign policy issue, including in the Sunday Guardian, so I would not go over those plus about what G20 meant for uh, that transformation uh, of India uh, adopting a Nari Shakti uh, foreign policy, Videsh Niti. So uh, that's, uh, that's what I would uh, also say. But you know, I was looking at this, uh, this cover, and I found it really uh, you know, that it epitomizes uh, what the issues are and the struggle is. And it is indeed in many ways Sisyphean, uh, both the struggle for peace and the struggle to mainstream gender, to mainstream women, peace, and security agenda in our overall quest for peace. But as long as we, as you said, uh, build a constituency, both international and, of course, national, but also local, we will be able to climb that mountain and, and overcome. And as you said, hope will prevail over despair. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Puri. You've, you brought on the conundrums especially, and one of them remains that uh, uh, we have made a great, uh, shall I say, effort to push this agenda. Although India is not a signatory to 1325, and many uh, many women's groups, uh, it, it sort of stands by the spirit, but many women's groups have very interestingly bricolaged around this by invoking uh, GR, um, uh, the resolution 30 of the CEDAW, to which India is a signatory, yeah. which talks about women's roles in, in. So India, you know, we are very, very deft at this whole way of finding, uh, difficult, you know, passages out of an impasse. And that's where the creativity or whatever 
Lakshmi talked about this civilizational creativity lies. So this this continues to be a conundrum in our in our space, and uh, thank you for pointing it out. That increasingly, it's resonating. Remember that Nepal is one country in our region where from the from the highest levels to the grassroots, everyone was talking 1325 at one point of time. Of course, there are difficulties and there are many, um, shall I say, criticisms of 1325, but that we will come to later. But it is one very powerful instrument.